I live in Akron, Ohio, and this weekend we had the 84th running of the All-American Soapbox Derby. It's where these big square cars with wheels roll down a very steep hill uh, by with kids in them. And I went down because I'm doing a local Akron, Ohio podcast. I had to get out of my comfort zone because I had to go talk to complete strangers. And what was interesting is I wanted the inside perspective from an actual driver. So I had to first get permission from parents to interview their kids who had no problem getting on a microphone. And when I turned around to interview the parent to get the perspective of what it's like to have a kid in the Derby, I'm here to tell you, they almost turned and ran. It was amazing. They're like, no, no, not me. Nope. No, no, no. So if you're thinking of starting a podcast, embrace your inner self. And today I was listening to a book called Someday is Today, 22 Simple Actionable Ways to Propel Your Creative Life by Matthew Dix. And he was talking about how we should look at our life as what will our 100 year old self say? Should I start the podcast? Should I not? Should I watch more TV or or should I not? And that 100 year old self kind of ties in to today's guest, which is Jordan Grummet. He does the podcast Earn and Invest. And he has a book coming out next week, which is why he's on this week. And that's why there is no question of the month today for those of you that are regular listeners. But his book is Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. And wait till you hear about the fun things that happened to him because of his podcast. Hit it, ladies! The School of Podcasting with Dave Jackson. Podcasting Sense 2005. I'm your award-winning Hall of Fame podcast coach, Dave Jackson, thanking you so much for tuning in. If you're new to the show, I help you plan, launch, and grow a successful podcast. My website is schoolofpodcasting.com. Use the coupon code LISTENER, L-I-S-T. E-N-E-R when you sign up for either a monthly or yearly subscription. And then, of course, that comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So, yeah, today's going to be a little different show. Normally, I have the question of the month. And because Doc's book is coming out next week, I wanted to say thank you for him coming on the show. And I'm going to tell you something a little different here. As I listen to this, if you are a regular listener of the show, I always talking about... You know, get your housekeeping done quickly and get to that meat and potatoes. And Doc is here because he has a cool because of my podcast story. But there's a whole bunch of stuff about his life as a hospice doctor. And if you look at hospice, I know it looks like host spice, which is I know a lot like popular demand thinks that was the original name of ginger spice. It's not hospice is where people go who are terminal. So when you're a a hospice doctor, you're basically helping somebody be as comfortable as they can before they pass. And normally I wouldn't include that kind of stuff because you're here to learn how to connect with your audience. You're here to learn how to grow your audience and be better interviewers and things like that. But the stuff, here's the thing, like you trust me, right? It's interesting. I went to take a scalpel to it and I just couldn't. And there's some things in there about where he talks about doing a subtraction exercise. So I'm going to be right here with you listening to this. But if you're listening to this thinking, hey, when's he going to start talking about podcasting? Chill out and listen to what Doc is saying because it's good stuff. Because I don't know if you know this or not, because it, it dawned on me and I was like, wait, what? Me? Yeah, and that is, um, we're all going to die. Yeah, isn't that fun? Hey, welcome to Monday, kids. Guess what? You're going to die. Yeah, it's true. And this is, an so that's not what we're really talking about, but the fact that why would someone pick this particular field to work in? So there are some things in here about pivoting and finding a job that you really want to do. And I know that is, a lot of people's objective. 
And so that is why it's going to take us a little bit to get to the absolute podcasting stuff. But I'm here to tell you, I found it very interesting and we'll get to it right after this. All right. You can find him at Jordan Grumet. That's G-R-U-M-E-T, jordangrumet.com, or check out his podcast, earninginvest.com, his new book, Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life, will be in the show notes at schoolofpodcasting.com slash 837. Doc, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be on one of my favorite favorite podcast, The School of Podcasting, with one of my favorite podcasters. So this is really an honor. Well, thank you, my friend. That's uh, that's the best way to start an interview ever. Like, all right, <laughs> and we're done. Thank you so much. So when did you know you wanted to start a podcast? So it's a funny story. I was a physician practicing for years and years, and I was getting burned out and starting to realize that being a physician wasn't my thing. What was my thing, what I kept on coming back to is I love to write and I love to public speak. I started to realize that maybe I had taken a wrong turn in life. I had gone into a profession which originally really fulfilled me, but no longer felt like it was. At that time, I discovered the financial independence movement. I learned about personal finance, started realizing that, hey, I have enough money that I have some wiggle room here. I can start going after those things that I love, those things that I had made hobbies like writing and public speaking. And I started writing about personal finance. And a friend of mine who I had met at a bunch of different conferences said, you know what, you and I need to do a podcast. And I love talking. I love having deep conversations. In fact, that's why I go to places like conferences so I can meet with people and have these deep conversations, the kind of conversations I was never having in the doctor space, but all of a sudden I was in the personal finance space. I was when I was talking about blogging or public speaking. This seemed like the next best thing. It seemed exciting and we just jumped into it. And funny enough, I realized that interviewing people is probably a big part of that passion that I was searching for all those years, that creativity that I really wanted, that I liked, the part about public speaking I liked, the part about writing that I liked was really diving into these deep conversations with people. So I really loved it from the beginning. Nice. And so what was the goal of the podcast? Really, the goal of the podcast was simple. I had realized that I had to understand my finances so I could pull myself out of medicine and start doing those things that I wanted to do. Strangely enough, it took me about three to six months of really doing a deep dive of reading and thinking about it and writing about it to realize that the actual financial tools weren't as hard as I thought they would be. Like I could learn how to save, I could learn how to budget, I could learn how to invest. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in today quite a bit. And so here, Doc is saying, you know, that financial thing, it looks pretty hard. And then he got into it and went, oh, really, uh, this isn't as hard as I thought. And I'm here to tell you, I've had so many people ask me with podcasting, hey, what's next? I'm like, that's it. You're done. You're launched. Just keep doing episodes. And they're like, seriously, there's got to be more to it. No, there's not more to it. What I felt was missing were those deeper conversations of now what? Right. So we had heard the 101 before. We had talked to people about how you get to your financial goals. But I didn't hear as many discussions about what do you do once you hit those goals. When I hit my financial goals, instead of being excited, I actually got a little bit depressed and anxious because I realized that I had put this idea of getting to a financial place, what I would call financial independence, but a place of financial instability became so important in my life that it became my singular focus. And then Mm -hmm. I got there and I said, wait, life isn't about money. Money doesn't really speak to my identity or purpose. I thought being a doctor did that. But no, that didn't do it either. So a big part of the podcast was to really have those deep conversations with other people who had gone through this, those experts who had studied finance, who had studied wealth, who had built businesses, who made real estate empires, and really get deeper and ask them, so what does this actually mean in your life? What's the purpose? What does enough look like, right? Because I had focused on enough money for so long that I started realizing enough money is not truly the bigger quote unquote enough that I was searching for. So that's what I really wanted to do with the podcast. I didn't do it to make money because I was in a financially privileged place where making money really wasn't that important. And as you and I both know, if you're out to make lots of money, (laughs) podcasting is probably not the thing you want to start with. 
Um, Not if you want to do it quickly, that's for sure. Yeah. And I didn't feel like I needed to be a guru or had a bigger following. I just wanted to have those intense conversations and learn. And the beauty of it, when you start a podcast, that's exactly what you get to do. Deep dives into topics that you want to learn about. And those gurus that you want to talk to that wouldn't give you the time of day, now they will because you have a podcast. In your medical career, you ended up as a hospice doctor, which God bless you, because when my dad was in hospice, that is not a fun work environment. How did you end up there? And that kind of leads us into your book, which is uh, Taking Stock a doctor's advice on financial independence, building wealth, and living a regret-free life. So how did you end up in hospice care? Because I can see you on video. I don't see the wings sprouting or it's like... (laughs) Dave, there are no wings. I hate to tell you. (laughs) So how did I get into hospice medicine? Well, you have to start at the beginning. My father was a doctor. He was a cancer doctor, oncologist. He was well-known. He was well-loved and well-liked. And he died when I was seven years old. So I hit death face on as a young kid. And in fact, I still believe now that's what propelled me into going into medicine myself. My dad died just right at that time where I wanted to be just like him. I idolized him. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I told myself the story that this is what I should do in life. My identity is I should fulfill his role and do all those good things that he was never able to do. So it became a huge part of my identity. I get to medical school and you know what the first thing I do is? I volunteer to be in the hospice department, in the inpatient hospice department to volunteer and help families. So it was the first patient I ever saw was a hospice patient. But then I did what people normally do, which is they don't listen to themselves. And so instead of exploring that as a possible career choice, maybe one I wouldn't have burned out with from in the first place. Instead, I went down the path of general internal medicine and becoming a doctor who pretty much takes care of all non-surgical problems. And don't get me wrong, I'm glad I did it. And it really did fulfill my sense of purpose at the time. But at some point, I started getting burned out with the paperwork and the stresses and the late night phone calls, all those kind of things that you never think about when you're a young, starry-eyed high schooler, for instance, thinking about becoming a doctor. When I realized that I had enough money, I started doing something called the art of subtraction. I said, I don't really have to work anymore, but I've identified myself as a doctor my whole life. This is the only identity I know. Instead of wholesale writing that off, quitting, and pretty much probably diving down into a deep depression where I didn't know what to do with myself, instead, I slowly peeled off the parts of the doctor world that were bothering me. Like, what is giving me friction? I, at that time, owned my own practice, and I was stressed out because the phone calls and the weekends and the things like that. So the first thing I did is I said, well, you know what? I don't really need to own my own practice anymore. So I stopped doing that. Then I was working in some nursing homes. But the thing about nursing home patients is they tend to get sick at three in the morning. So I was getting all these calls at three in the morning. I was stressed out. I wasn't sleeping. So I said, you know what? I'm going to subtract that out of my life. I don't need the paycheck anymore. What I was left with was the one thing that still gave me a lot of value. The one thing that I would do, even if you weren't paying me for it, at least in medicine, because I'd podcast and I do podcast and I don't really get paid that much for it. But the one thing in medicine that I would continue doing, even if I wasn't being paid for it, was practicing hospice. And therefore, I knew that instead of wholesale letting go of that doctor identity, I built up all those years, that there was a part of it that still had a huge amount of value for me that I still wanted to call myself a doctor and do this work on a regular basis. But I didn't have to do it in a way that was painful. So I didn't have to do it on weekends. I didn't have to do it at nights. I could do it part time in my own schedule. And I kind of built that into my work life so that I wouldn't burn out from it, so that I continue to love it. And that's how I knew that hospice was something I was meant to do. And I think having my father die when I was so young, feeling those feelings, feeling like I understood what patients and families were going through. It really Mm -hmm. spoke to who I am as a person. Now, you have some really cool because of my podcast stuff. So your your network that you may not have even known existed ended up with you getting an agent. It definitely did. And, And here's the beautiful thing about podcasting, especially if you've been doing it for years and especially if you interview other people. The great thing about being a podcaster is 
you celebrate other people's achievements and knowledge. So I was continuously inviting people onto my podcast that I looked up to that were writing books or creating courses or had ultra successful podcasts or blogs themselves. And I got the chance to invite them on my show to study them so that I came well prepared to ask the right questions, make as good of a podcast as I could, and then celebrate them and market that episode when it came out. You know, it's a real privilege. And if you do that for enough years, people really respect it and you become friends with people. And then they start looking at you. In fact, someone who I had met through blogging and podcasting named Grant Sabatier, he had been paying attention to my podcast and my blog. We had been talking a lot. And he came to me and he said, you know what, Jordan, you really need to write a book. He said, your experience with hospice and your experience as a personal finance expert is just something that no one else has. Yeah. It's a unique perspective. And I had thought about writing books and I had self-published two books in medicine years ago. I became a self-publisher by default. I actually wanted to get an agent and traditionally publish at that time, but I had never had the confidence or the know-how because at that time I didn't know anyone who had ever written a book. I didn't know any agents. My podcast changed that all because all of a sudden I had a group of people who were super experienced, they could tell me how to write a book proposal. They could tell me how to approach an agent. And more importantly, and which did happen, is a number of them, including our friend Joe Salcihai, wrote warm introductory emails to their agents because they had written books saying, Jordan Grummet's my friend. I've collaborated with him for a long time. I think he has some really important things to say. How would you like to look at his book proposal? Before I podcasted, I had no access to all that knowledge, know-how, and connections. And it was through interviewing people, celebrating them and their accomplishments that actually built really the structure of what I needed to get where I am today, which is having a book that is traditionally being published with an agent that's going to be coming out in August. I don't think I could have ever gotten anywhere close to this without all the help that I've gotten from people who I became friends with because I invited them onto my podcast. So when you have them on your show, you celebrate their appearance. What part of you is going, but did they share it on Twitter and did they put it in their newsletter? Are, are you keeping score or how important is that to you that they share it out in that whole nine yards? So of course I, I love people to share it out, but I have one rubric that really, to me, is the most important thing when I interview someone on my podcast. When I'm done with the conversation, if they are smiling, laughing, and say, hey, man, that was a great interview, then I feel like I did my job. Notice how Jordan is not focused on him or his audience because he knows the guest was good. Otherwise, the guest wouldn't be coming on. The guest is going to bring the value all Jordan has to do is make sure he serves the guest, gets all the hurdles out of the way, just makes it super easy for that guest to serve his audience. And that's kind of how I measure everything. It's because, again, when you come into and when I came into this podcast, I didn't have to make money. I didn't have to right. build a huge following. So I was able to explore what do I want to get out of this, which is to have a deep, interesting conversation, and what do I want my participants to get out of it? So to me, a big part of this is that when I interview someone, I really want that to be a shared experience. I don't want them to feel like they came on and got thrown a list of questions at them that had nothing to do with them or who they were or that we were having a one-way conversation, And which is interesting because I don't like to insert myself too much into the conversation during my podcast, like I like to ask questions and then let people expound on what they know about. But I found that a lot of my personality comes out by what kind of questions I ask and how I ask them. So I don't worry too much about whether they share it or not. I yeah. don't worry about how much they promote it. I always figured if I do something that they think is the coolest thing since sliced bread, eventually they'll spread it or they'll tell someone about me or they'll do something that eventually reflects well on me. And I don't do these things because I want them to. I do this because I truly want that experience of having an amazing interview. And, and I do want to celebrate people. Like if someone comes on to me, someone I believe comes onto my show and they write a book and I really believe in that book, I've read it and I interview them about it. 
I really want that book to do well. So that's like my piece is, hey, I know this really cool person. They wrote this really great book that I think can help a lot of people. How can I get the word out? Well, and that comes back to what I always talk about is serving your audience. And you're like, hey, I found a cool book, found a cool author. I need to get this person in front of my audience. And speaking of your audience, one of the things that you had them do, which is awesome, is if I understand this right, they got to read the manuscript to kind of help shape the book a little, or at least give you some feedback, I would assume. So again, I've been really lucky to build a community of people who, A, just really buy into Earn and Invest, or they really buy into me, or I've had them on as guests, because you know this, you have people who are fans, they write into you, and they say something particularly interesting, and you're like, you know what, we should do an episode on that. Yeah. So they become participants and fans, so you have all these supporting characters and crew who are now available to you, who feel connected to you in this community that hopefully if you've done it right, people realize it's pretty selfless, right? You're putting in the time and the effort to build this for you and for them, but you're really not getting much in return. So those people become your advocates. And so, yes, there are plenty of people I sent this out to, plenty of people who were guests, but also super fans who I sent this out to. And then I was interviewing and talking to two people, Bryce Leung and Christy Shen, who had written a book about personal finance and financial independence. And I had had them on my show multiple times and I was asking them advice about how to promote my book. Cause that was one of the big black boxes for me is, okay, once sure. I write this thing, how am I going to get it out there? Like I can be on podcasts, I can do a bunch of things. And they said, you know what you need to do is form a ground crew. These are mm -hmm. super fans who you are going to make a mailing list. You're going to send them some info. Maybe you'll have them read the book early. And then when you get to that week when the book drops, you're going to write them a daily email and ask them to do little things for you, right? Put something up on Twitter, tell a friend, review the book, simple stuff. Well, after thinking about that, they said, you know, 10 or 15 people. I said, you know, I have my podcast and I'm talking to them twice a week when I'm having my episodes. So I said, why don't I open this up to podcast fans? So if I have a few thousand people who listen to every episode, maybe 5% or even 1% might be interested in being part of a ground crew of people who are kind of really enjoy this. They really enjoy what I put out. They're excited about the book. Maybe they can become part of my ground crew. And so I put the call out and I said, I'm making this ground crew. If you really dig what you're listening to, if you like this content, if you're interested in the book, come become part of the team. And I got, you know, 130, 140 people who signed up that want to actively participate in the book launch. And now I have this little subgrouping of people who I know are super fans who are totally interested and excited, and I can give them little bits of extra content. I can make it worth their while. My plan is to eventually actually give them an advanced version before it actually, the book drops itself. Yeah. And so these are my super supporters. And again, how do you market a book? I don't know. How do you market a book? Well, now I have this group of people from my podcast who's passionate about what I'm passionate about and is willing to help me because they recognize that I make this content for them, that they're now part of my community and this is exciting for all of us. And it, it really, it changes it from something that's scary or frightening mm. to something that almost feels like, oh, this is what it feels like to have people, right? This is what it feels like to have support. This is what it feels like to have a community who's interested in you succeeding. And that's a new feeling for me. Like when I, when I self-published books, I had people who supported me, but I never felt like I had such a deep community. So has any of your audience had a chance to, to read what you have so far for the book? And if so, did they give you any feedback on and on? Like were they, did you get any feedback that wasn't, this is the best book ever. Did anybody say, I was confused when you mentioned this or that. That's one of the benefits of having a, a tight group is if they really love you, they'll say, yeah, this part wasn't that great. I had a number of beta listen or beta readers. I sent it out to a good 50, 100 people. And you know, there were some hard lessons. I actually rewrote this book about three or four times. Yeah, just me. You know, I got to point out that I always say don't release the very first thing you record because authors have rough drafts, actors have dress rehearsals, and you're going to hear how it was hard to go through this process of getting feedback. But in the end, he ended up with better content. Grant Sabatier, the guy who really pushed me to do this, he helped me do the book proposal. When I sent him the first version, he said, you don't have a book here. 
I had spent hours. I had written like 65,000 words. And he looked at it and he said, there's some good stuff here, but there's not a book yet. And that was hard to hear. And throughout, I've had people who have been very upfront and said, this works, this doesn't work, et cetera. And that doesn't mean you listen to every single one of them. But what I've since learned, which is something I never knew about until I got into this process is, you know, there are a lot of cooks in the kitchen when you write a book. Usually you write a manuscript, your agent may look at it and your agent may say, you know, I don't like the way you're doing this. You might want to do this, this, or that. Then you send it to the publisher and the publisher's like, oh, the title's all wrong and we need to do this and we, this is all market better, et cetera. So there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. On the other hand, what my agent told me, Anna Geller, and what I found to be true is at the end, the product turns out so much better than you started. And so having all that input, so there'll be times when I totally agree with someone's input. There'll be times when I don't agree at all. But thinking about it deeply and putting it in perspective and having all those voices come in really ends up creating a much better product. And so I feel like I had a lot of that input from my community just, again, even to get to this place. But it, it was painful. I mean, it, it really is painful. Writing a book, you've written books before, can be very painful. It's not uncommon to have to trash your first or two versions, even if you've put lots of time into them or at least change them significantly. So your first two books were self-published. This one, you worked with a publisher. Your next book will be? I know? think I will never go back to self-publishing, which makes me different than other people. I really like the support. Like I said, I think having an agent and having a publisher really pushed me in directions that I wouldn't have been brave enough to go into. And I think the end product came out better. Still, most definitely me. I wrote every word, but they pushed me to be more creative. They pushed me to use better examples. They pushed me to organize in different manners. They called me out when my language was BS and didn't work right. Um, mm -hmm. They gave me perspectives that I hadn't had before. So me personally, I think from now on, fingers crossed, if I do decide to publish more books, I think I would go traditional if I can. The book, Taking Stock, you're, you're building this on your you know, your history as a hospice doctor and your finance. So it is, it is your peanut butter and chocolate that are, are not exactly <laughs> obvious together. So, and I watched a, a YouTube trailer that I'll have in the, the show notes. And you talk about how people that are whatever, six weeks, six months, they're, the, the clock is ticking pretty loud. And they usually don't say, you know what I wish I had was, was more money. Uh, that's usually not the, the case. What other insights? I know this is such a vague question, but being a hospice doctor, like, is there a common theme or like what are your top three answers that people go, oh, I wish I would have, you know, that kind of thing? So there definitely is. And, and let me premise this by this idea that I had been studying personal finance, trying to figure out the role of money in our life, asking these 201 deeper questions on my podcast. Mm. And at the same time, was interacting with these people who all of a sudden were told you have six months or less to live. And it took a moment for me to realize that the machinations these patients were going through as they were contemplating their own mortality and trying to figure out what do I need to accomplish in the next bunch of months to feel like I've ended my story correctly. Mm. It just added such a new layer to thinking about money and what we use it for and what it accomplishes for us. Like you said, very few people on their deathbed say, I wish I worked harder, wish I'd spent more weekends in the office. <laughs> Most of the time, it's something to the extent of, I wish I had the courage to do in life what I really wanted to, or I wish I was more thoughtful about what I really wanted to do while I had the time. Right? So that may have to do with relationships. Right, Maybe relationships that have gone bad or relationships you never formed because you were too afraid. That might have to be bucket list items or, or skills or things like, for me, a big one going through this process was traditionally publishing a book. I was putting it off forever because it scared me. It was something I deeply wanted to do, but I always figured I had more time. I put it off because it was painful and difficult. I've had so many hospice patients who did that for their whole lives. Mm. 
And then they get to the end of the life and they say, why didn't I try? Right. We're so afraid of failure, but it's not failing that we look back on and are miserable about. It's not trying. Like anyone who's failed stupendously at the end of life tends to look back and say, well, I failed stupendously, but at least I tried, man. At least I was in the arena fighting the good fight. It's the people who sat on the sidelines, I think, that really regret it in the end. And so in the end of the book, I I list all sorts of things that I've learned from the dying and what you should invest in and et cetera. But I think the real big story, what the dying have really taught me is you need to be much more thoughtful and intentional about things like purpose and identity and connections in your life, you got to start thinking about that stuff in the beginning and then start working your financial life as a tool to get you those things as opposed to starting with your financial life and saying, I'm going to make tons of money so I don't have to work so much so I can finally do what I want. Maybe we need to start with what do I really want to do and then let's build that financial around it so it makes sense so that we don't have to wait until we're 60 or 70 or God forbid on our deathbed to start actually thinking about what we want out of life. You said you were kind of scared of this, which would make sense. I know I was when I, I, the last book I did was with a publisher. What do you think was the final thing that, that nudged you? I know you said you had a friend that said, no, you need a book about this. What do you think finally got you over the hump? I think it was a few things. Certainly the podcast, because I had interviewed, so I do panel interviews a lot of times. So I do some single and some panel interviews. So imagine after two or three years of doing this, I've interviewed three or 400 financial experts, entrepreneurs, lots and lots of millionaires, lots of podcasters and writers. So I had interviewed tons and tons of content creators And I knew that the purpose of money in a lot of ways was to be a tool to do the things you really wanted to do as opposed to be a goal. So I'd spent so much time thinking of it as a goal that I let that cloud my vision of anything else I possibly wanted to do. So one thing is people were telling me over and over again, no, you really got to think about what you want out of life. So that was in the background And then what was great about Grant is he just wouldn't give me the excuse. Like I had every Mm. reason or excuse not to do it. I could make all these up, but he always had an answer. I said, I've never had an agent before. He says, I have an agent. I'll help you. I've never done a book proposal. He said, I've done book proposals. Get this book, read it, and then we'll make a book proposal. Like he took away all my excuses. And so when I thought about all I had learned from the personal finance people, all I had learned from the dying. And then I had this golden opportunity of this highly successful author who was saying, I'm going to help you. Like that's life all coming together at once. And I just couldn't excuse myself from doing the hard work anymore. Hard work that I deeply wanted to do. Like I couldn't let fear get in the way of that anymore because if I didn't do it now, there wasn't going to be a better time. Like the, the world was speaking to me and aligning everything perfectly. I would have been a fool not to listen. Well, tell us a little bit about your podcast, earn and invest.com. My guess is with a name like earn and invest, it's, it's probably about money. I'm joking here, but uh, <laughs> who's, who's the target kind of audience for that show? So in a lot of ways, I am not the perfect podcaster because I have such a varied and wide range of interests. So Ultimately, the goal for the show is it is the 201 about money, right? So not the 101. We're not interested really specifically in how you budget or how you save or specifically how you invest, although we talk about different investing options and those kind of things. It's really more about how do we use that money? How do we use that tool to create a great life and to sustain us? So generally, it's for people who start feeling comfortable with their finances, but want to know what's next. What's that next level? What's that next step? Now that I'm starting to feel like learning about my finances specifically, it's possible. I can do this. I'm smart enough. I can read up on this. I can learn specifically what to do. How do we then use that superpower to search out our own real purpose and meaning in life. Occasionally, I will throw in an episode that is not specifically about finances and not specifically about leaving your career, but is just about life in general. So my friend, Joe Salcihai, who who is friends with both of us, 
you know, once we are talking about what types of issues I like to talk about on my show, and he's like, you're the kind of guy who likes to run towards a car crash. And in a lot of ways, I am. Like, I like to talk about the issues of the day. So, for instance, recently there was a nurse named Redonda Vaught who was found guilty of criminal negligence because of mistakes she made while taking care of an ICU patient and was actually will be put in jail for this, right? So normally when we talk about doctors or nurses making mistakes, we talk about medical malpractice where they are sued and their insurance company or even sometimes them themselves have to pay money. But this was a change because they decided that not only was there an economic issue, but this was criminal negligence and they probably will actually put her in jail because they found her guilty for this. That was one of those car accidents I decided being a doctor, but also just because I thought it was so important for the general public, I wanted to run towards. Like, I think the thing about it is money touches on just about everything. And so I give myself Mm -hmm. the opportunity occasionally to talk about very widespread issues because I think there's a money angle on almost everything out there, especially every interesting news story. Any advice for the new podcaster? How long have you been doing your show? So I started my show in November of 2018, right? So three plus years. Again, you know, a lot of people say, just jump in, do a bunch of episodes. You'll probably hate your first 50 episodes or whatever. I actually don't hate my first 50 episodes. I like them. I think you just got to go for it. I really think you got to just jump in. And I think you have to be cognizant of what your audience wants, but that can't be the whole reason you create content. Like you have to understand what you want, what you want to get out there, what your purpose is, and then find the middle ground where it also fulfills other people's needs. I know there was a time when I was very watching very closely my downloads and thinking about growing the podcast. And I started thinking a lot about Hmm, I could do this. My audience would really like that. And I could do this. My audience would really like that. And there were some things I added on, I think, that were very beneficial and that I liked doing. But there are also some things I tried that I realized didn't really add to what I thought my message was and didn't feel as comfortable, even if maybe it would get me a broader audience. And so I think that's really important. I think you've got to know what you want out of the podcast. And if you're not loving it, then you're probably doing something wrong because we all know that this is a slog to do a podcast correctly for anything more than 10 episodes. It's really a slog and you have to like things other people don't like, like editing and listening to it again and rearranging it. Like you've got to like some of that or it's very difficult, but you've got to love the reason for putting it out there. And if you don't, A, I don't know how many people are going to really like it, But even if they do like it, you're not going to enjoy it. And so I've seen lots of famous podcasts, right? Quote, unquote, famous podcasts disappear. Because at some point, their creators no longer loved it, even if their audience started to. Oh, I got to pop in here. Yeah, it's not enough to start that new true crime show because, hey, that's the hottest thing. Yes, your audience has to like it. And yeah, you want to do it because it's the hot thing. But if you don't actually like true crime, if it's not authentic, it's not going to work. Yeah, well, when I asked you who this is for and you started off with, well, it's not 101, it's 201. And instantly in my head, I was like, well, that's cool. Because half of knowing what you're going to do is identifying what you're not going to do. Because you're not, I'm not sure what to talk about. Okay, well, I, you know, I get that. That makes sense. Let's talk about what you're not going to do. And all of a sudden, it's like you were talking about before the subtraction method. Right. Okay. Well, I know I don't want to talk about this. When I was in bands, we're like, all right, um, I'm in a country band and we could play Skinner, but if we do Skinner, we're going to end up playing the doors and then we're not a country band anymore. So, all right, no Skinner, no this and that. <laughs> Had to be a, a top 10 single. And all of a sudden that left us this nice pool of tunes to, uh, to play. So I, I like the fact that you, you really seem to have a great idea of knowing what you're going to talk about. How do you handle when, because I'm assuming you get pitched people to to be on your show, how do you politely tell them, no, thank you? You mean when people pitch themselves to me? Yeah. So 
if you do podcasting long enough, and certainly if you have a little bit of a fan base, eventually you're going to get tons and tons of pitches, right? I, I'm sure this happens to you. I know it happens to Joe a lot, our friend, and it happens to me a lot, is you just start getting the emails one after the other. Often I'll get audience members, too, who say, I'd really like to come on the show because of this. So usually my answer to them is, your story is interesting, and boy, you've done some really cool things. My issue is that the pressure really in creating a podcast is that at some point you need to start focusing on what's really unique about someone's story. So mm -hmm. for instance, in the personal finance space, we get tons of people who say, I paid off $40,000 of debt and then I started a side hustle and now I have six figures in the bank. Like when you first start, that's really interesting. When you've been doing this for a few hundred episodes, it's interesting, but it's not unique. Do yourself a favor, hit the back button one time because that was gold. So those are very valid stories. And I always, always validate was when someone takes the step of, of being vulnerable and writing you their story. A lot of these are validly cool stories, but not necessarily fit into kind of the format and what I'm playing. And, and there is, and I tell people this all the time, there's really a pressure to not talk about the same thing all the time. Like I think as a podcaster, I really try to create a varied experience, maybe not every episode, but certainly from time to time so that it feels like they're getting something new or different. Um, so it's not always the easiest conversation, but you know, you rarely get ahead by lying to people <laughs> or you rarely, <laughs> you rarely keep your audience members or keep the respect of your community by putting them off or lying to them or having them on the show when you don't feel like it's going to create a good episode. Because you and I both know this. My best episodes usually are when I'm super excited about the person I'm having on. And if you're not feeling that as the interviewer, it shows unless you're really, really good. <laughs> yeah. Let me show you how to fake it. Okay. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, you have two books. You said that were medical books before you wrote this one. Have you seen anything different now, you know, that you have a podcast that it's going to look like sales are going to be different than your first? Now, nah, that's that's almost not fair because one's a medical, two are medical books and one is kind of, of you know, it's a, we are comparing apples to oranges. But have you seen anything that you're kind of like, oh, well, this is cool. So my marketing plan is completely and utterly different. I remember with my two medical books, like I didn't have any resources so there are a few blogs I showed up on at that time. This was also, you know, 2014, 2016. So podcasts were not as big. Not everyone was a podcaster in 2005 like Dave Jackson. <laughs> but I think I showed up on one or two random podcasts with very few listeners, as well as I showed up on a few blogs here and there. Already in run up to this book launch, I've got myself booked on podcasts with hundreds of thousands of listeners. I've already in pre-sales sold more of this book even before it's out than my other two books because I've been invited to speak at conferences and I've gotten people to donate money to provide a book for each conference member. So I've sold 300 books already just to five different conferences, which I'm going to be attending right off the bat before I've even, before the book has even come out. So I can tell you immediately the, the amount of books I'm going to sell for this book will be by far more than for either of those two books. And for those of you that are new to interviewing, that guy just dropped a cool strategy. And had I just gone, oh, okay, next question. What was your aha moment? I would have totally missed it. Instead, I asked this follow-up question because I know my audience just went, wait, what? Well, let's back up to that strategy. What's the pitch to get somebody to buy your book? to make them look good. You said that it's like, well, there's a different strategy. Cause I know I've been to conferences. There's always the book in the bottom of the bag and you're like, what's this? Oh, it's, you know, so how did that go about? So again, because of my podcast, I've become friends with all these content creators, these people who have platforms and who sell things. So I've gone to a bunch of conferences. I've seen these people at their conferences. And so I called them up and I said, How'd you like to donate 200 books or $200 to buy some books so that the next time we go to this conference together, we can give everyone a book. 
And at the conference, we'll make a big deal. We'll say, this is sponsored by your platform. Thank you for generously donating this money. And so, A, it makes them look good. B, it costs them very little. A lot of these people that I know have courses and podcasts and things that make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So if I say, hey, you want to donate $200 for some books, no big deal. And then they also get to, hopefully, I've sent them all the books so they can read it. And hopefully, if they believe in it, they feel like they can give something to these conference members that'll help them in the future, which is mostly what all these people want to do. They like to make money, no question about it, but they really want to help people. Um, So it's really a win-win-win for everyone around. So the person who organizes the conference, they just got a bunch of free books donated to them. And so they look good because they're providing books to all the conference goers. It's just yet another value add for them. So I guess the point being, everyone benefits. And, you know, if you have enough people supporting you and donating, most people don't even have to put up that much money to help you. And is this the the one other thing I was thinking about this, because it's a great idea is are these bought in a way that affect any kind of Amazon charts? Are these bought directly from the publishers, which is at a discount, which makes sense. You'll get more books that way. How does that work? So I've learned some very interesting things about Amazon charts, by the way, because believe it or not, you can buy a thousand books on Amazon, but if it's the same person buying them, I don't believe it changes your Amazon bestseller rating very much. So Amazon bestseller rating actually has to do with the time between each book being bought by different people. So if you have Mm -hmm. 100 people buy a book within an hour, your Amazon seller rating is going to go up hugely. If you have one person who buys 100 books, it's not going to change a huge amount. In this case, I knew I could get much better discounts if we went right through the publisher. And one thing I've learned from a lot of people who've done this is I flipped my intention. So as opposed to my intention being, I want to be famous or I want to make lots of money on this book, My intention is to get this book to as many people as I can who need it or it could help them. So when you take kind of that profit issue out and I'm in a very privileged place that I don't have to really worry about the profits as much, I'm okay having them go buy directly from the publisher and maybe getting a little less of a return so that it can save them money so we can get as many copies as possible so we can get it to as many people as possible. So since my intentions have changed, my goal is to make this as easy for everyone as possible. So in this case, we bought all of them through the publisher themselves. But well, the thing about that, though, that sometimes we forget, that's also a seed. You are planting seeds. So anybody who reads that book is like, well, wait, who is this Jordan guy? And then they go, oh, he does some sort of podcast thing. And so they start listening to your podcast. So now you've got you're growing your fan base. So when the next book comes out or the next course or the next, whatever the heck your next appearance, whatever, it seems like you're giving it away, but you're planting seeds and you never know, you know, when those are going to come up to when it's time to harvest them. And all of a sudden you have somebody come up to an event and they go, yeah, I got your book about, I I think it was back in 2022 and now it's 2024. And I saw you and it's like, wow, I had no idea that when I worked this deal, to give away a bunch of books that was going to lead to somebody asking you to keynote or something. You never know. Yeah. I found that when you go at life with the right intentions and you be, and you try to be generous, it rarely goes wrong. Like you might not see the return (laughs) immediately, but if you're generally intentional and generous and you, you have the right idea behind what you do, it generally turns out pretty well. And who knows when or why or how, but, it's worth your while. And it, and it feels much better too. Like when you take yourself out of the equation of how is this going to benefit me directly and start thinking about how is this a good thing to do? It generally pays off. And I, and that's why I started podcasting. I didn't start podcasting because I thought I was really going to gain anything one way or another. I started podcasting because I thought it was like this cool, generous thing to do. It's like, Hey dude, come on, let's talk about your thing for a while and let's deep dive deeply in it and celebrate who you are. And it's turned into all this. So I, I can't complain. And have some fun, maybe. Yeah, have a lot of fun. I mean, I still, yeah. you know, I, I always tell people, my best moments are usually when you're about to hit record with a with a guest. To me, that's that moment of exhilaration, excitement, wondering if you're going to do a good job. I still get anxious and nervous. So that moment of anxiety of, am I going to totally throw this thing and my guest is going to think I'm a fool? All of that together, that excitement, that 
and and then getting towards the middle and the end and you're like, oh yeah, we we did this. We hit a home run and feeling good about it. Like to me, there's still nothing like that. Thank you so much. Everybody go over to earn and invest.com. Jordan, thanks so much, buddy. Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks. It was a blast and uh, love talking to you. Oh, so much to pull away from that. I love the fact you, I'm starting to notice a trend. The people that are having success with their podcast did not start out white knuckling it, trying to make money. They did it to serve their audience. I love the line about, look, yeah, it's interesting, but it's got to be unique. And that's something I, it's hard to be unique when you've done 800 and some episodes. I love that. But the one for me that jumped off the page was the art of subtraction. In fact, I actually announced to my Patreon group for my weight loss podcast that, yeah, I'm shutting it down. And just to do this super quick, why? Number one, when I go to record that podcast, I go, ugh. Yeah, that's pretty much it. That's how you know when it's time to shut down your podcast. When you go, ah, oh, God, yeah, is it that? Ugh. So I told the, the Patreon group, hey, I'm not going to charge you, and I'll be shutting this down in the next month, which I've been saying for about three years at this point. So it's a long time coming. It's the art of subtraction. And the bottom line was, was that helping me lose weight? No. Was it helping me make the school of podcasting better? No. So I'm killing my darlings through the art of subtraction. Links to everything I talked about with Doc G at schoolofpodcasting.com slash 837. Coming in the future, we'll be talking about his new book, 101 Podcast Episode Templates, the one and only, you know him from Build a Big Podcast, David Hooper will be coming back to the show. And you just have to remember one website address. That's schoolofpodcasting.com. When you go out there, you can subscribe or follow to the show so you don't miss that interview with David Hooper. You can sign up using the coupon code LISTENER for a monthly or yearly subscription. You can sign up for the newsletter. There's some really cool bonus content in the newsletter this week. It's all there. That one website is schoolofpodcasting.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. Until next week, take care. God bless. Class is dismissed. Lots of podcasters and writers. So, you know, I knew... Oof, I lost my train of thought there. What was the question again? Yeah, let me show you how to fake it. Okay, hey! <laughs> yeah. Um, the Man, I had a really good question. I, see, normally, this is at a point one, normally I would be sitting here with a pad and pencil and a <laughs> pen that doesn't click. And instead, I'm using Notepad well, now I can't take notes because I'm going to have all this in the background. And I was like, oh, and I had a question. I was like, okay, I got it. As soon as, you know, and I'm still listening, you know. The, the I drill. just keep talking to you, forget your question. That's always my was, goal. 